Hi everyone, this is Sarah and I am here to talk to you today about, can you recognise it? Masaccio's Virgin and Child Enthroned from 1426 in the National Gallery. This is my little drawing of it. I left out the angels and this is it in the National Gallery. So, uh, this is a lovely painting and it is our example of the early Renaissance. Uh, so, we, um, before I get started, there were the three questions that I asked you about. So, what is the baby doing? What position is its hand in, his hand in? And how many angels are there and what are they doing? Uh, so, they were the questions that uh, I gave you to have a think about. Uh, and we shall have a look at the painting. So, it's an early Renaissance painting. Now, the early Renaissance was um, a period of art. It lasts from arguably the 12th, 1300s. Just a moment. Back again. The working mums, respect, and dads, of course. Any carer, parent, anyone dealing with someone else. Amazing. Never get two seconds. Anyway, here we are again. Where was I? Renaissance, 12, 1300s through to the late 1400s when the High Renaissance begins. And the High Renaissance then continues through until about the 1520s. Though recently I've been having discussions with colleagues. Some of it goes right through the 1500s, but that's also mannerism, which I love. And we'll be getting to a bit later. Anyway, this early Renaissance, what you see happening, we looked at the Margarita Verezza. Uh, which was very flat. Then we looked at the Wilton Diptych, which was an example of international Gothic. Then with the Renaissance, what changes is realism um, and the study of the real world and of anatomy and of space and things like that to make more realistic paintings. And that's what we start to see here. So if you look at the figure, you really get a sense here that this is a there's a form underneath these robes. You can see the knees here. Um, there's a sense of mass and of weight and of volume. She's very sculptural. It's almost like you're looking at a sculpture here. Um, and you also get much more of a tender relationship between mother and child, the way she's holding him. Then if you look at the Christ child, he looks much more like a baby now, like lots of little folds of flesh and um, all chubby, like a, a good toddler. Uh, is and um, what he's doing is much more naturalistic as well so what's he doing with his hands did you work it out he's eating some grapes so something that a toddler might do and he's got some juice on his fingers so he's licking the juice off his fingers so that's very naturalistic but also subtly symbolic not in your face symbolism very subtle so the grapes make wine and wine in the mass um, in the roman catholic tradition it's believed that that transforms into the blood of christ that's so symbolic of the blood of christ and his ultimate crucifixion and this is a panel from, it was a much bigger altarpiece made up of lots of different panels. Um, so above it would have been a crucifixion scene. So it would have made a, a direct link to that. And um, he is um, also, if you look carefully at his hands, his hands, he has two fingers in his mouth of his right hand. And so this is the sign of blessing which we've seen already in the previous two paintings, but again, much more naturalistically done. So this is all much more naturalistic. Um, and this realism is in large part influenced by this new interest in ancient Rome and through that ancient Greece. And the sculptures that were being found and the sculptures that they made in ancient Rome and Greece were very naturalistic and anatomically correct. And this filtered through into art. There were lots of other reasons why realism became um, more important to artists, but that's one of the key reasons. So the other place where you see this realism is in the space. So you still have the gold background of the earlier Gothic art, but this throne is very three-dimensional. It looks as though it's receding into space, using something called linear perspective, which art artists would explore over the next hundred years or so. Um, and um, also you see in this throne the interest in the classical world. So you've got columns here and the little decoration along the bottom of the throne is taken for the little S shapes, is taken from ancient Roman sarcophagi and tombs, which links to the burial of Christ and the crucifixion of Christ, and then he was entombed after that. Um, also, get more of a sense of space because of the foreshortening of the lute here, as though it's receding back into the painting, both of these lutes here. And then one of the things that artists struggled with were halos which showed that they were divine beings. You can see them here and on the Virgin Mary. And you can see they're like plates at the back of their heads. And 
they're gold, and the gold removes the illusion of space because there's no shading or muddling. And so artists were like, how do we keep these halos but still make the space look as though it's receding into the background? And you can see Masaccio experimenting here with the halo of the Christ child. And here, this halo is not flat against the surface of the painting, but looks as though it's receding off into the distance. And over time, the halos would be, the artists would stop using gold for halos because it removed that illusion of three-dimensional space. Uh, and very quickly, we're in Florence in the early 1400s. Florence was the hotbed of the Italian Renaissance. Um, and we'll look a bit later on at Northern Renaissance art. But he hung out, he was really good friends with two other important artist type people. One was the sculptor Donatello, who did these very powerful, this is Mary Magdalene, these very powerful sculptures, very emotional, very realistic, very dramatic, um, which you can see with the sculptural form it influenced his work. And he was also, this is from a great book, Vincent's Starry Night and Other Stories, A Children's History of Art by Michael Bird. It's lovely if you've got kids. This is Florence in the 1400s. And his other friend was Bruno Leschi, who did design, finally, the dome of um, Florence Cathedral, which is very difficult. And he was also an expert in depicting three-dimensional space on a flat surface. And that is what we are going to be looking at next time with an artist called, didn't get organised on this, Uccello, Paolo Uccello. Where is he? Um, here it is. Uccello's Battle of San Romano. And I have three questions for you. Those questions are, how many people are dead in the painting. Sorry, I'll show it to you again. How many people are dead in the painting? Um, <coughs> who is wearing the best helmet or hat? And which side of this battle scene is winning? The people on this side or the people on this side? So there are your three questions. I'll post some activities. I hope you're all doing well with the lockdown. Nice to see you all. And I finally managed to get this done. Working with a kid, you never get anything done. <sighs> Try and stay sane.